All right, so I'm Andrea Abrams. I am the Associate Vice President for Diversity Affairs at Center College. I've lived in Danville about 13 years. The first uh, 10 years I taught at Center, I teach anthropology, gender studies, African American studies. And today I'm going to be your host as we talk about your experiences about being black and particularly about living in the black neighborhoods of Danville. So that's why you've been selected to participate in this. And I thank Cheryl for Burton for reaching out to all of you and getting this organized. And um, I thank you all for showing up on this weird Zoom format to, to help us work on this project. There are going to be artists here who will be listening to what you're saying with the goal of then creating pieces of art that that capture the spirit and the importance and the memories that you're gonna share with us today. So I'm gonna go over the format that we have. Um, I'll have the artist, artist uh, introduce themselves. You were, some of you were given a consent form, but we're gonna go over it one more time to make sure we're all on the same page with that. I'll have you introduce yourselves. I'll set some ground rules for how the discussion will happen and then we'll talk. Is that good? Okay. Yes. All right, great. So in that case, Sandra Charles, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Sandra Charles. I'm an oral painter. Can you give us a little bit more? Oh, yeah. Like last sure. time you told us all this <laughs> stuff about how would you <laughs> no, it? I tried to be convincing. <laughs> it is early. Um, I'm an oral painter, and my uh, work, uh, it emphasizes uh, issues that affect African-American women. Uh, I've created projects uh, for really based on like my life and my experiences, um, uh, such as the African-American Warrior Project, which dealt with women uh, in our history that we didn't even know about that really just changed the history of the world. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. It's, most of my work de deals with African-American women, the issues, and I like doing this project because um, uh, I'm learning a lot about Danville that I didn't even know about before. And so and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, creating some artwork. Thank you, Sandra. Um, before, actually, before I go into the consent form, there are some other people on this call who are part of the team that put together this project. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves so you, you'll know who they are. They'll be mostly silent through this, but I didn't want you wondering who these people were. So uh, let's start with Nikki. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm the director at Art Center of the Bluegrass, and I am on the team that is putting this show together. So we uh, greatly appreciate your input on this, and we're here to listen. And um, we hope that through this show in the winter, we'll bring our, our community together um, to have some more conversations and to learn more about what it's like to be Black here in, in our community. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Amy? Hi everyone, I'm Amy Frederick. I teach art history at Center and uh, I've been happy to be on the, uh, the advisory committee for this project and I look forward to uh, the conversation today. Thank you. <laughs> Brandon? Hi, I'm Brandon Long. I'm the visual arts director at the Art Center of the Bluegrass, and uh, I'm really excited about this uh, opportunity. I'm really excited to get to meet a lot of you guys, so good to be here. Kate? Sorry, it took me a minute to find my mute button on the tablet. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm the associate director at Art Center of the Bluegrass, and Mostly what I do is marketing and fundraising. So I get to tell everybody about this great project once uh, we have it together and ready for the public. Thank you. Lisa? Yeah, I'm, hold on. <laughs> uh, hi everybody, I'm Lisa Williams. I don't have my camera set up right here, but um, I'm so happy to be here. I teach at Center College. I've, I've lived in Danville, um, 
since 2001 and um, excited to be a part of this, of this conversation on this, um, not a part of the conversation, but on the, the advisory board here for this project. I teach creative writing and so I can get students engaged in this project as well um, if, if we would like that to happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Atkins. Good morning, Ben Villians. I'm J.H. Atkins. Uh, I go by a retired educator. All right, thank you. That's the most succinct I've ever heard you be. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of this conversation is that you're being asked to participate in a community conversation hosted by the Art Center of the Bluegrass. The purpose of this conversation is to hear your thoughts, memories, and experiences of being Black in Danville. The content of that conversation will be used in the creation of an art exhibit that will be on display at the Art Center of the Bluegrass, both physically and online from January through March, 2021. As a participant of this project, you are asked to take part in a Zoom meeting with a facilitator and other community members. One or more artists will be in the Zoom. The Zoom is being recorded and the recording may be shared with artists and the public as part of the exhibit. Both your words and your likeness may be visible to the project, to the public. As a participant in this project, there are no foreseeable physical or emotional risk or discomforts to you. If you should at any time feel that your participation would subject you to either physical or emotional risk or discomfort, you are free to remove yourself from the project. There may be no potential benefit to you for participating in this project, other than a sense of satisfaction that you have contributed to a better understanding of the Black experience in Danville. There will be no cost to you for participating in the study. Again, your participation is voluntary and you may withdraw at any time. There will be no penalty to you for refusing to participate in any aspect of this project. Your name will be published within the context of the exhibit as a participant in the re recorded conversation. So at this point, I need everyone to raise your hand if you agree to participate in the project under these conditions. Just physically raise your hand for me. All right, thank you. So we'll get started. Um, so I'll be asking you <laughs> questions about your experience, but as much as we can, I'd like it to be kind of like it was when we first started. Y'all just talking to each other, you are free to do that, to respond to each other and then have a conversation. The best case scenario is that I just shut up and y'all talk, okay? So that is a good thing. But I will sometimes interrupt you. Um, we have a set of questions we wanna get through. And in this hour, we wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to speak. And so there may be times when what you're saying is really important, um, but in the interest of time, I might raise my finger like this as a symbol, like I need you to wrap it up. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, I just need to keep things moving, okay? Um, um, I also may call on people, even when your hand isn't raised, to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. And I don't know how familiar you are with Zoom, but talking over each other can happen. So the best thing to do is before you speak is to raise your hand so people know that you're gonna speak next. Is that okay? All okay. right. Um, you are encouraged and invited to be as honest as you can about your own experiences and perspectives, and you're expected to be respectful of other people's experiences and perspectives. So with that, we'll begin. And I'd like to begin by asking you to introduce yourself, to give your name, how long you've lived in Danville, and what black neighborhood or street you live in or are living in. Okay, and let's start with La Fonda. You're on mute. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is La Fonda Stallworth. I am a native of Danville. <laughs> I'm a native of Danville, and I actually live on 3rd Street here in Danville. All right. Um, Reverend Smith. Okay. Yes, Ralph Smith. Uh, 
Grew up on Russell Street um, for exception about two years. Uh, lived here in Danville at the present. I live on Duncan Hill. Um, All right, thank you. <laughs> yes. uh, Ms. Burton, Martina Burton. Hi, I'm Martina Burton. I moved here in 1982 after I married my husband, Bobby, which he was a railroader. I'm a retired nurse and um, I lived on uh, Pontiac Avenue out here in Indian Hills in Danville. Thank you. Ms. Myers. Um, I am a Danville native as well, born and raised here, grew up on 2nd Street, um, and I currently live in the same neighborhood as Martina. Um, we're kind of neighbors, right, Martina? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ms. Stanford, Betty Stanford. Yes, my name is Betty Stanford. I was born in Florida, but my mother came to Kentucky, and I've been living in Kentucky probably all my life for 40 some years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tanya. Uh, I'm Tanya Sanders. I was, uh, I am from Denver, been here all my life. I lived on Randolph Hill. Uh, Second Street with my grandmother and my and uh, McIntyre Homes, and now I live on Sea Biscuit. Thank you. Uh, I can only see Rita as the name, so if you can introduce your name yourself. <laughs> my name's Lanier Bowman. Uh, I live in West Denver, been here all my life, and we was considered every child I hear was considered as the black kids across the railroad tracks growing up. Cool. Thank you. Um, this, this Betty wants to correct something. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. I was thinking about <laughs> when I lived out the pipe, but uh, first being living in Danville, I lived in Kentucky, I would say 75 years. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't know who this is on Tish's Pinky. <laughs> That would, be, that would be me. I have no idea why I, I don't see video, but that's okay. My name, <clears throat> and excuse me, I just had surgery. Um, my name is Tish Walker O'Ray, uh, born in Danville, lived a little bit of everywhere in Danville, everywhere from Second Street to the projects and every single one of the projects. Uh, now live, um, I've been to and from from Kentucky to Ohio to Detroit to back home and live on the east side of town right now. Thank you. All right, so what we're gonna do first, is we're gonna invite y'all to tell a story. Not a long story, but a good story. And the story I want you to do, tell is to think back um, to what it was like to live um, when you were younger in these black neighborhoods. And what is one of your fondest memories of living in these neighborhoods? Uh, Can you share that story with us? Everything. Neighborly. <laughs> Someone talking? Who has a memory they'd like to share? Well, I'm gonna pick on the person I know how knows how to tell a story. So I'm gonna go with Reverend Smith. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I grew up on Russell Street, uh, which was a, a very close neighborhood. Um, very fine memories. It was a, a street where, you know, we grew up. We, Russell Street has a hill. So in the wintertime, we could always, you know, slave down the hill. We, we would skate, uh, homemade skateboards. We would start from Carter Street, go all the way down to Russell Street. Um, Russell Street was a, a place where um, people was, at that time, was funny about their, their yards. Uh, I can remember one instance where uh, one of my puppies, I had a puppy that, that, that got loose. It went down about two doors, and the lady that lived there, I'm not, not going not to call their names, but they didn't like animals, dogs. And I went to get my dog, and she had, had threw hot water on my pup and nearly killed it. Oh. 
I can I do remember that. Uh, I remember one time uh, riding my bike down the street, and the lady that lived next door was backing out. She hit me and locked me into a telephone pole, <laughs> and got out and asked me, "Did you, did you see me backing out of my car?" <laughs> you know, those <laughs> memories, fun memories. Uh, but it was a a a, a good street um, that I grew up on. Thank Very you. Fun memories, yes. Yeah. Any other memories? Yes, Miss Burke, yes. Miss Lamford. Yes, I can remember uh, when we lived on Fourth Street. And when we lived on Fourth Street, it was several homes and things down there. And my mother, she lived right where Lee's famous recipe at. Wow. Circles across the street. We didn't have the money to go to the circle. But when nighttime come, we would slide down that hill and got in free. <laughs> then, then going after all of that, when all that was over, she'll send us to pick some blackberries. We would cross the uh, the railroad track back there, and we enjoyed that. And I was all afraid of snakes and things. And yeah. when I saw one, I would run. When I got home, I didn't have no berries in my bucket, but she sent me right back across the railroad because we don't run all the berries and jumped out. <laughs> then my husband, he worked at at a uh, Bun Boy, uh, Henry Fisher. At that particular time, at that time, you couldn't go in the front door. You had to always go in the back door, and I'll never forget that. But then I can truly say we made it though. It wasn't like we gave up. We was, you know, had to go to the back door, but I still got what I wanted, and that was very necessary to me. Thank you. This is Tisha's pinky. Mm -hmm. um, I think my favorite memories were always the projects when you didn't know that you were basically poor until someone told you from the government because you stood in line and got that cheese. That cheese in that box was um, amazing. It was a brick hard cheese, but amen, <laughs> amen. It was I I it. <laughs> but we, we uh, ate everything with that cheese and all the flour and the carnation milk, uh, the dry milk that came along with it once a month. And right around there, somewhere in there was the line that you stood in, which was next door to, I think, the meat processing plant, where on a down drift, you could smell uh, an uncanny smell of meat being processed and it was disgusting, but that's where we lived in the projects, along with, well, once upon a time, a swimming pool. And uh, I was really young. I remember just seeing it. I don't remember being in it because I do believe someone drowned and then it was closed up. But that was okay because we had the rock fence. And the rock fence was the fence in front of uh, Batewood Homes. And um, we lived in the back and we lived in the front. My memory was my mom uh, chasing a chicken in the back. I don't know why, but um, we moved to the front and I was allowed to sit on the rock fence until the street lights came on. And if you're gonna sit on that rock fence, you're gonna sit on it. Across the street was the swing land and the swing land had all the latest 50s and 60s and uh, music playing. And so we got to dance as well. And uh, everybody streamed through the projects just to see what was going on and bump the music and say hi to all your friends. We never knew that that was considered the poor side of town. We just knew that we had a great time as a kid and everybody protected those children. And um, uh, the only warning you got was, uh, you don't belong over there. Wherever there may be, that's where you didn't go. Okay, thank you. I remember that cheese in the box. That made grill, good grilled <laughs> cheese sandwich. I wish uh, I had some down. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, um, I was raised out here on Fedview, and it was like all black, and we all was just like family. If one got a whooping, the other ones got a whooping from each other's parents. And we used to play baseball over in the field. And we are the part of the corn and glass uh, lawsuit where they used to dump 
out there trash and poison and stuff. I hear, so it's probably why all of us are crazy out here. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we was just like family. <clears throat> there was no white people around us when we was coming up. And I can remember going to the bum boy and going through the back door. And I didn't pay attention then, but we used to go to the um, show up on Main Street when we had to go to the top. Back and we couldn't go mm -hmm. to the bottom. But my, I don't really remember so much racism when I was coming up. It's after I got older, I guess I just, we just didn't pay attention there. Yeah. But this is a racist town. Why do you say that? Well, I have, I have put, I got a bachelor's degree and I'm not trying to say it to uplift myself. I'm saying it because I couldn't get a job in I got it in criminal justice. I put in applications everywhere. Got the interviews, two or three, never got the job. Didn't have a criminal background. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Have been to the hospital, put in the application, just, they won't hire you. They wouldn't hire me. Now, it's just, it's racial in the justice system when it comes to black men. Most women <clears throat> everywhere gets off lighter. It's a lighter sentence than a man. <clears throat> but when it comes to the justice system in the world, most black men get a harder charge than the white man for the same offense. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. We're actually going to talk some more about, um, I've, I do have some questions to talk about race relations in Danville. Um, we do that a little bit later, but thank you for bringing that, uh, getting us thinking about that. Um, so I'm going to ask a slightly different question on the same topic. So every neighborhood has those people everybody knows, right? The leaders, the helpers, the troublemakers, the characters. Who are those people in your neighborhood? Why are they important to you? Can you tell us some stories about the, those, those leaders, those helpers, those characters, those troublemakers in your neighborhood? What, were they you? Were you those people in your neighborhood? <laughs> in my neighborhood growing up, I grew up on Duncan Hill. Um, had a really good childhood on Duncan Hill. Um, some very fond memories, and to go back with what Tisha Ray Pinky was saying earlier about the commodities, I remember my mother gathering all five of us up, and we walked to the Two Second Street, just really the corner from us, with a red wagon, and mm. we go in there and get our commodities and come back home. This was the norm for us. This was the norm. And um, then we just uh, lived a couple of doors down from the cemetery, the Hilldale Cemetery. And every time they would cut their grass, uh, the kids in the neighborhood, we would go up there and um, really kind of play hide and seek where we would bury ourselves underneath the grass. <laughs> and uh, whoever was it had to find everyone. So, um, we just had lots of fun, and I can remember um, H. Gillespie um, and Buck Owsley and different ones riding their horses um, down the street, and me and my brothers chasing after them. Um, those were very, very, very fond memories, and I, I don't remember any bad people um, in our neighborhood. Everybody was good, and that was the days when we were using coal to heat our homes. And I remember trying to go from the kitchen to the living room um, with my eyes closed and ran into the stove. I still have that scar today. <laughs> and a neighbor down the street named Big Meat 
Um, <laughs> he actually put such of on my arms. Um, but big, he, big. <laughs> and so, you know, everybody just kind of nurtured everyone in in my community or well, on the street, on Duncan Hill Street back in those days. And that was probably the early 70s. Thank you. You're welcome. Tanya. Uh, I was uh, raised on Randolph Hill and like all of they talking about the commodities and the cheese and the spam. I remember all of that. And we had older people mm -hmm. like uh, Miss Henretta, Miss Maggie Bell. Those older people, they would have you do work for them and like one would give you a cupcake, one would give you a nickel, but you always had <clears throat> respect for these older people. And I enjoyed the first of every month because you know, everybody was poor, everybody got new shoes. So we would all race up and down the hill, see who could run the fastest of getting these shoes from the dollar store. Uh, all the kids, we you know, we would play, we would fight, we would still get along. Um, I remember going to, when we went to bait, it was like all black. And I didn't, had never been around a lot of white people until we had to switch schools. So that was uh, an experience for me, is going from all black to mixed in you know, all us together. And when we went to our black school, we had the most respect for those teachers. You know, you didn't talk back. They didn't mind uh, whipping you or spanking you. We had one that used a whip, Miss Jones. I know Ralph, y'all probably remember Miss Jones. Uh, Miss uh, yeah. Dale, she had a ruler she would hit you with. Uh, Miss Margaret, she was our first grade teacher. Everybody loved her. She would put you over her lap and spank you. Um, but those days, I wish they was like that now because we had respect for the older people and we respected it was yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, please. And thank you. And you just don't see that anymore. And I think that starts at home anyway. Uh, my child is 38 years old. And now when I call her by her name, she says, ma'am, but you know, they don't do that anymore. I wish they would bring the respect back for the older people. And they look at me when I say yes ma'am and no ma'am to the older people where I work. You know, that's just respect. I yeah. wish one thing we did get that people would bring their kids up and learning to say yes ma'am, no ma'am, please and ask for stuff, not just give me. But back in those days, we had respect and those older people and they didn't mind correcting you. And I had one auntie that if you I don't care who you was, if you was bad, she would take her shoe off, which was my cousin's mother, Walter, and she would whip you with that shoe. So <laughs> anybody was with her, they knew that you was going to be on your best behavior. Thank you. <laughs> so let's talk about some events um, that happen in the neighborhood or with the folks from the neighborhood. So I'm thinking now about block parties, dances, weddings, birthday parties, graduations, fights, funerals. Um, what were some of your sweet, whether sweet or sad, what are your strongest memories of the neighborhood and your neighbors? And I'm going to start with Miss Myers because I have one thing we've heard from her yet. Um, I guess some of my fondest memories are all the cookouts we used to have. You know, we used to have this big cookout well they cooked out all the time and then when they would cook out just everybody would come. i live i grew up on second street but i also felt like i grew up on clark street which was the street behind it and that's where we did most of our playing i mean you would ride your bike up and down the street like it was your job from like nine to five you just could not stop riding and then if you got really bold you'd venture out to third street and hope nobody saw you and call your mom and dad yeah. and tell them. but um <laughs> yeah, just, just the neighborhood being together, like we had a big backyard, so we always played kickball back there, um, you know, and people just knocking on your door to just say, can you come out and play? And my buddies were Donnie Shannon and Old Fitzgerald. Those are my two buddies. And when they knock on the door, I was ready because we had already planned it the night before, like <laughs> knock on the door 30. And, um, and you could just play and your parents knew you were safe. But I think my fondest memories are just uh, the neighborhood, just the feeling of, Everybody loves everybody. My father would whip you. He didn't care who you are. People were afraid to walk through my father's yard. They were afraid of him, right, Fonda? <laughs> People were afraid of daddy. Yeah, so it was kind of funny. He was a character probably in our neighborhood because he was just funny. 
<laughs> why couldn't you go to Third Street? What was happening there? Well, it was a little far away. It was like a street over, you know, that was big. You know, <laughs> probably grew up, I'm the youngest of four. And so by the time I was seven, they were all gone. Uh-huh. So they were a little more um, protect, not protective, but I felt like they just kind of worried because I was, they were all playing together. It was just me and my niece. My niece and I grew up more like sisters because we're only three years apart, so. Okay, gotcha, it was- thank you. Miss mm-hmm. Burton, what are some of your memories? Okay, uh, I will say that when I moved here in 1982, I did live on Russell Street where Rev- Reverend Smith was talking about. I remember his mother and then I remember uh, my next door neighbors were Mr. Olis and Miss Katie Haynes, and they were yeah. a jewel. She would always say Mr. Burton <laughs> or Mrs. Burton. She made the best lemon pies. Yeah. But it was a lovely street. The kids all were safe, and they played there. It was a nice street to live on. Mr. Roy Hill, Miss Sue Bowman, Miss Bertha Bowman, and then the other Mr. Smith, Ralph Smith. But it was a lovely street. Thank you. <laughs> So th- these of you shared a lot of really uh, good memories of people and events. Um, how have things changed in, the, um, in these neighborhoods? What has been lost and what has gotten better? You know, I would like to say something about um, the events that we had a long time ago. Fourth okay. of July was a big thing in the black community here in Danville. And um, so that's when all the black people came together at the end of Duncan Hill. And we just had a wonderful time all day long. (laughs) Um, So we've lost that, um, you know, when that was, when that finally closed down, we lost that. And it had been a big part of my, my main memories of events growing up. Uh, we just couldn't wait for Fourth of July. We'd get a new frock, new outfit. Um, then we'd go <laughs> down to the ballpark and we'd play. Some people would play baseball, softball, um, and just, you know, they had food. They sold firecrackers. Um, it was just like a big family cookout every fourth. Uh, That was my fondest memories and I wish that we could get something um, in the community like that um, going again with um, I guess more diverse um, ethnicities there. But uh, it it really was a good time, a good celebration and also on 4th of July, you know, later on that night, uh, where McDonald is on the hill across from the Danville Manor uh, Shopping Center, um, that's where they had the fireworks. So everybody would be in Danville Parking and Danville Manor Shopping Center, climb on top of the roofs on the back uh, of the cars, um, on the back of the trucks, you know, just to watch. And that was a community wide thing right there. And it was just really, really, really wonderful. And um, I guess we still have that, but I guess location just kind of changed uh, the dynamics of that day for me. Yes, Ms. Sanford. Yes, <clears throat> I enjoyed all the comments, but still, I thank God for my life tonight, today. And I look back over my life as we was raised among the boys, as someone said while ago, nobody knew they was poor because everybody was poor. And right. going from house to house, this one was saying for a cup of butter, that one was saying for a cup of sugar. They shared all of these things together. It wasn't about they talked about it. When you eat at one place, you eat at the other place. When one gets bad, talk about a whooping. I mean, you get whooping things that you didn't even do. The older people, the older people say you done it. Believe me, you done it. Yeah, <laughs> many whooping, but. I hate to say it, some of the old people didn't tell the truth on me, but <laughs> I respect them though, because I know if I disrespect them, I would got another whooping at home. And I like that, and going from the rough side of the mountain, going behind stores as we had to go to get food and stuff. 
I can truly say God has brought me from a mighty long way. Amen. Thank you for that. Could have been poison or uh, anything. Mama would wrench this off and, and cut this off. Uh, apple. I never had an apple to take to my school teacher like some of them did. I, mean, I was even denied from some of the blacks in school. People don't want to give credit, but blacks ain't always been where they are today either. That's right. Never going to school, I wanted to go down there to Frankfurt. The teacher denied me because I didn't have the money. My mother didn't have the money like a lot of, I done good to get a half of an apple without taking a teacher an apple. And when you take a teacher an apple, they praise those children for bringing them. But we didn't have it like that. We didn't have it at all. But I thank God for what where I am today that he has bought me from a mighty long way. And that I enjoy helping others because I say today, if somebody had helped me, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And we love everybody. Everybody would do their own thing. Mama would tell us, stay behind the fence. If you go out behind the fence, when you, she goes to the grocery store, Lord, you got a whooping when she comes home because those older people going to tell you. They didn't deny nothing. But I enjoy talking to them. Mary Joyce and Bodie them over the fence. I mean, I really enjoyed that. But then when mama come home, if you've been good, you got four animal cookies. I don't know if y'all know what animal cookies are, but that's what you got for your drink. Four animal cookies. And I enjoyed that. I look at the animal cookies to say, I still like animal cookies. But that's where the Lord is. I love them. But I thank God what I did go through. Sometimes you have to go through the storm to get things done. It's just, that's my story. And one more thing I'd like to say. I know you don't think but I would like to say from 2nd Street. I, we had my uncle. A lot of people don't know this, and, and I never corrected nobody on what they do. But on 2nd Street, my uncle, his name is L.D. Parker. He's the one that owned the cab stand. Oh. And he sold it to the oh. river. He sold it to the river. And that was in 1943 when he got it. And the name of the cab stand was Yo Cab. <laughs> <laughs> Yo Cab, that was the name of it. And then I know a lot of you don't know Duke Jackson. Uh, they were doing some of the cab driving. I'm going to get off because I know it's not going to talk about that. Story. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, I let me say something. Yes. Uh, when uh, was down there where she was talking about where her mother and everybody lived, there was another old lady there. And we used to you know, like I say, swing the chicken to the head come off. Oh, like we would sit there and watch her till she would swing that tick that chicken's head, and when the chicken's head came off, it would just jump around. And when that lady died, they had her services at her home. You know, uh, the dude had the uh, body at the house. And that was the first time I've ever seen uh, somebody in their house in their casket and they had like a net over to go view the body. And that is something that has always stuck with me that, you know, they're doing that. And then remember when somebody said, you look like a chicken with its head uh Oh, well, I know what they're talking about because I've witnessed that chicken. <laughs> her swinging that chicken to the head came off, so I know what they're talking about. <laughs> Those were the things I can, and she made the best apple pie, too. <laughs> Those are some of the stuff that, you know, like that I remember. <laughs> yeah, I can see you remembering that. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> All right, so I, I want to um, kind of shift the conversation a little bit here to talk some about, um, to go back to this conversation about race and, and, and the, being black in Danville. And the way I, I think I wanna go about it is how do you think, when you think back about when you were younger to now, how did things change or remain the same, get better or worse when Obama was elected president compared to Trump? Oh, gosh. Hmm. Well, I think that since Trump has become president, he has bought everybody out of the closet. 
all these people that were racist, uh, we didn't know, but now we know. And then when they do and say things, and then when you call them out on it, then we're the bad person. They're so used to saying and doing things to us and nothing has ever been said. It was just like, okay, you know, they, well, I guess it's no, it was normal for them. And we just sit back and took it. But nowadays, nobody is taking anything. And when you do or say anything, um, you're the bad person. And that's one of the things I just don't, you know, Trump has bought a lot of people that some people I wouldn't even, didn't even think of that are racist and prejudiced. And when I try to tell them about it at work, they don't, well, people start, yeah, they are like that. I have witnessed a lot of it since uh, he's come into office and especially in my workforce, I have seen some and some of the people that come in, they try not to show it, but you know, I know they are, they won't let me wait on them, but they'll let my boss wait on them because she's a white woman. Uh, but I, I just don't like it. And with Obama, everybody want to blame everything that went with Obama, you know, anything he did good, they want to bring him down, talk about him. They want to blame everything on Obama. But I liked it when he was in office. But now I hope and pray that everybody gets out and vote and vote that Trump out. Okay. I'll have to agree with what um, Tanya was saying because I feel like I've even had a person say to me, did you vote for Obama because he's black? And I said, did you not vote for him because he's black? And that usually ends that conversation because... <laughs> Like, I didn't just vote because he was black. He was the most qualified, you know, at that time. And I'm just, and if for us, you know, growing up, I never thought I'd see a black president. I'm 58 years old. So, you know, it was a triumphant time for us. And then when Trump got in, you're like, this can't be real. I just really couldn't believe it. And now that he's in, I'm like, Tanya, people are exposing themselves every day, especially on social media. I'm about ready to shut my page down. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah, I'm with uh, I'm with Arnetta. Uh, some of my friends have disappointed me greatly. I have a lot of friends um, in all kinds of uh, different aspects of the workforce, and they have disappointed me so bad. And uh, I never knew that that's the way they felt. But when I go on their page, the things that they post on their page that I can't see are a lot different than what I've seen on my Facebook page that they universally share. And they've disappointed me really, really bad. And I've been embarrassed. I've been hurt. And um, I work in retail where it's a little bit blatant these days. Uh, um, the business has changed within the last three years. The climate has changed. The conversation has changed. And these people still want to insist that, you know, customers always right, even though they're very prejudiced, as mama would say, they're very prejudiced, they're racist. I can hear them call me the colored girl. I can hear them call me the nigga. I can hear them and it hurts my feelings, but I still have to smile and keep my job. And now they have not only exposed, they just take, I mean, they just take the sheet off. They just take the sheet off, say what they want to say. Um, do what they want to do and uh, ride by with the Confederate flags and not understand. And even if you try to educate them, uh, they still bounce back with what little they know. And your opinion does not matter as long as it's their opinion coming out of your mouth. It's very frustrating. It is. It is. <laughs> What, what difference or what impact do you, do you think, and I'm, this is for everybody, anybody, what impact do you think or do you hope the Black Lives Matter movement will have on Danville? That's a tough one. I feel like that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement um, I think it will be a positive impact on Danville um, in, the, in, in the fact that we are fighting for, or they are fighting for um, justice equality. And um, that is very much needed everywhere, not only in Danville, but everywhere. Um, and I also feel that um, 
police officers need to be held to a higher standard, such as school teachers. Now I work in education and you just, you can't paddle children anymore. Um, and you have to uh, treat them a certain kind of way. And there's rules of when you can use this, this, this force, that force, or use this. And I think that the police officers should be held accountable for their actions, um, as well as the school teacher. If you see a school teacher on camera drag a kid down the hallway, I mean, they lose their job. I mean, if they um, if they harm the child in any way, they lose their job, um, and may even be brought up on charges. Now, policemen they are really able. I mean, they do everything. I mean, how does uh, a, a routine traffic stop for a broken tail light? Um, how is it that someone ends up dead over that? It was a traffic, I mean, you know, just a routine, you know, it was a, a, a tail light that was out. I mean, there should be certain protocols. I mean, excessive force is what is being used in everything. If a kid steals a pack of gum, and let's say he's an older kid, steal a pack of gum from the, from the general store, you don't kill him because he's he stole a pack of gum. Um... I just think that, you know, police needs to be policed and uh, there are certain guidelines that they should go by in every instance um, instead of using excessive force for minor things. Thank That's you. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. I'd like to see, you know, more <laughs> on councils and boards and committees, um, more you know, more just more black people downtown Danville, you know, when you go in a bank or a store or the hospital, I work at the hospital. So I'd love to see, you know, more, you know, nurse practitioners and PAs and physicians and, you know, cause I would love to have a doctor that looks like me sometimes or a nurse that looks like me. Love to see that, that is my, and then like you say, just awareness, just more diversity, awareness and training for the police force and the judicial system as a whole. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to build on that to kind of wrap us up because we're getting close to 11 o'clock. And I'm going I'm to ask everyone to answer this question, okay? Um, this is what I call my magic wand question. Thinking back on the, your, your good memories um, and, and your sad memories of, of growing up in these Black neighborhoods, thinking on the things that have been brought up in this brief discussion we've had about race and racism. If you had all the money that you needed, if you had all the power and the resources that you needed, what would you like to see happen in and for the Black community of Danville? What does the best version of Black Danville look like to you? And you have all the, all the money and resources you need to make it happen. What does that look like? I'm going to start with Reverend Smith. I knew I was coming first. Um, if we could all come to, together in unity, learn how to love each other, learn how to work together, and I think that would be the key is, is you know, unity, all together, learn how to be one with each other. And I think love goes a long way. Thank you. Ms. Stanford? I think love has a lot to do with anything you go at. If you don't put love in it, you don't have nothing at all. And I think if I had a lot of money, I would like to see more black industry, more black churches, more black schools. I would love to see that. And having all the money in the world, what money would do any good if you don't have your help? And I would love to be able to help somebody else because I say, somebody help me. And nothing wrong. I get joy when I'm helping somebody less fortunate than I am. Thank you. 
Ms. Good. Myers? Um, well, since you said how much money, I would love to see like more black owned businesses, you know, um, just even when you go in stores, just more, more things that, I don't know how to put this, but um, just, I guess, different types of things in stores that are more appealing to the black person and what that is, I can't just say one thing, but just um, like a museum, um, you know, more art in stores that, you know, that look like people like me. Um, you know, like I said earlier, physicians, nurses, just more people like me when I go out and about the town, because I know there's only like 1,600 of us in this town, so it would be nice just to see more of us and have opportunities here that would make the young professionals that have left Danville want to come back. Ms. Burton. I would like to see more programs for the youth and more mentors. You know, like I remember when I first come to Danville, I, I didn't mention Mrs. Helen Fisher Fry, but back then they had two black women's club, the domestic economy and the busy sunshine. Reverend Smith's mother was part of that. But they taught us young women how to entertain at home. We traveled across the state. We learned a lot of things. And I think the young women, then the, the club sort of faded out, but I think, you know, it would help the young women because the older women taught us. And, yeah. you know, that was just, there was something, it was more things. We did, you know, did stuff for the community and all, but then it got to where just like our sororities and everything, missionary meetings, everything is fading out. Nobody has time. And the young women are not going to do what we older women did. They're not just going to do it. You know, it's just, Times are changing, and everything's busy, but that's my intake on it. Thank you. Ms. Bowman, you're, you're on mute. I would say, as Arnetta said, like more, you know, like a soul food restaurant, um, a black owned store, maybe three or four of them. You know what I'm saying? We just don't have, um, we can't get the money to open a store like the Arabians. And, you know, I, I went to the store down on uh, 4th Street one day and I asked the guy, I don't know if he's from Pakistan or where, but I asked him, how do y'all come here and open all these stores? And he said, well, all you have to do is go to the bank. <laughs> well, I done been to the bank, and I couldn't even get a washing machine. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We need some, we need some black-owned stores around here. There's hardly nothing black, but a, but car wash and funeral home. Miss hmm. Burton, you have your hand up. <laughs> yes, I think we. One thing about the other cultures, I've worked with Indians and different things. They band together. It may be four or five families in one home. Right. But we as black people, we don't support each other as much as we should. We <laughs> probably wouldn't buy from going to the black stores. No, we're going to take our money and go somewhere else. That's and right. we, need to, we need to band together. And that's why we fell apart. We just don't support each other when one, you know, we should be happy when one black succeeds. But instead, we'll go join forces or move to the other neighborhoods and so forth like that. Amen. That's right. Amen. Sometimes we rock our own worst enemy. That's right. But I have to say this yes before we go. I've been here 67 years. I have tried to do things uptown for the black people. But I give Cheryl Burton props because Amen. nobody in Denver has ever spoke up like Cheryl Burton has spoke up for the black community. And I wish I wish everybody in every black church, white, whatever, you know, just give her the opportunity to be the city commissioner, whether you love her or like her or not. And I was at Sunday church, was she running against Atkins? And I wish black people would open their minds up to realize that we can have more than one black Amen. city commissioner. We could have four if we stand together. Right. In but a whole lot, 
Denver is not together. You know, we just need to come together as black people. And if you, when you go to the polls, vote Atkins and Cheryl Burke. Amen. Let there be two, at least, whether you like either one of them or not, vote for them anyway. Right. But nobody has spoke for Denver, Kentucky, no more than Cheryl Burton. And I'm not saying this just because she is, uh, if she's on here, because I ain't seen her. I think I heard her. But never in my 67 years have I ever in my lifetime heard someone speak out like Cheryl is speaking. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, Tanya, your magic wand. <laughs> I think the first of all, I think we both should love the way God loves unconditional. And like they have said, uh, I've always said that when we have, we do need more black businesses, but we all need to stick together. We will not support each other. That's how come the others will they will make it in business because they will stick together, they will work together, and they will support each other. And that's the one thing that I've always noticed here in Denver when you do have something a black business. We don't support each other. And that's the main thing we'll have to do is support each other and stick together. If we stuck together, we would have a lot of power that's right. here in Danville, but we have to stick together regardless if you like me, you don't like me, or you know, if you don't like anybody, don't let that stand in the way of doing what needs to be done. Because if we all, it's just too many of us and we just need to stick together support each other and stop saying, I'm not going to uh, make that person rich. I'm not going to do this. It's not about that. It's about sticking together, supporting each other. And that's what we need. And we need to do that. And then everybody needs to love each other regardless. Just love like God loves, unconditional. You know, that's, that's if we did that, oh my gosh, no, no, no telling where we would be. Thank you. LaFonda? Hey, um, my thoughts on this, if I had all the money and all the resources and in the world, I mean, the world will be endless for me, okay? But I'm not saying, you know, saying that, but what I would do is I would give back to the community as a whole. I think that the Black community um, if you would, I think that that is a thing of the past. Black communities were formed because of segregation. Okay, so I mean, railroad tracks, you know, across railroad tracks, you know, there was no blacks. On the other side of the railroad tracks, there were blacks. So they kind of kept us in our places. So today, so since um, desegregation, integration of the schools, I mean, you know, it's equal opportunity for everyone. So if everyone is given a chance, just like the schools, Fayette County Public Schools, I work for them, uh, their motto is no child left behind. And I would say no humankind left behind. No one is better than the other. And uh, if, I had, if I had the resources, I would build a big gym so that anybody who wanted to play could come out and play. Anybody. I mean, there's got to be an inclusion of everybody. We are no longer segregated. And so, I mean, we have freedom to move around the country. We just need to for others to allow us to move around the country and not uh, get any friction about it, uh, not being killed over it. Um, if I had the resources, well, just put it this way. If I had the druthers, I mean, we'd all be in this together. And just like the political parties, Democrat, Republican, I'm really sick of that. Um, I think that there should be no affiliations with any party. You should vote for the candidate that you feel will best serve or, or you know, the office and serve the people of this country well. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democratic or um, 
independent. Yeah, or independent. Thank you. I can think of it. Or Thank independent. You. It just doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I say one more thing? Yes, if I had the money, I would build, have something for the youth mm -hmm. because there is nothing, nothing for the young people to do here in Danville. And that's why if you find something for the, have a place or something for them to do, then they would be in this trouble as they're in. So I would love to have a big place for all the young people to have somewhere to go on the weekends after school, have somebody there to mentor them, help them with their schoolwork so that, like I said, none of the kids would be left behind. They would all have the help that they need. I would love to see something like that. Thank you. Tish? Well, if I could use that wand, uh, it would be global. Um, <laughs> I would use it to, to tap into the resources that the major cities have and that they use for the youth, um, for the women, uh, for women of color, for black businesses, for black churches, uh, all the brotherhood and sisterhood um, that um, organizations that help everybody and make it inclusive, but specifically for African African Americans to get a jump so that they know their business plan, so that they know how to ask for the loan, when to get the loan, where to get the loan, and make sure that we have more than one person behind the counter as a teller, and make sure that they are CEOs, make sure that there are more than one just cash clerk, make sure that they own the store, buy property, learn how to do the real estate, learn how to do everything, and put certain people in positions that uh, will do this globally and make sure that they check on little towns like Danville, Kentucky, so that we can prosper and be bigger and better. Thank you. Well, thank everyone for sharing. I, um, I'm really inspired uh, that this question about when you have all the resources, and all the money, you want to use the money for businesses and education, but also that some of you didn't even want the money. You wanted love and you wanted solidarity. And I think that says a lot about uh, this group of people. And thank you to everyone for being so honest and for talking to each other and for sharing your stories. And thank you to the two artists that are here. I look forward to what you're gonna do with all of the powerful and funny and poignant and angry and important stories that got told today. So um, thank everyone for participating. Nikki, did you want to say something and close up? I, uh, my internet went out, so I missed a little portion of this. I'm glad it's recorded so I can go back and, and listen. Um, and yes, we appreciate it. We know it's a vulnerable subject and, and we're listening and look forward to the show in, in winter to continue conversations and, and dialogue. And again, thank you so much for your Saturday morning time. Yeah. You're welcome, Nick. You're welcome. All right. Well, that that's all of all hearts and minds are clear. To say in the church, um, I'll let y'all go and enjoy the rest of your Saturday morning. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank, Thank you. Hi. Uh, Adios, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.